So today, let's talk about rebalancing. This is something we do at Vector. What is rebalancing? When we divide up a portfolio into different time periods or different asset types, naturally, they're all going to grow at different times. You're moving different directions at different times. That's part of being a diversified investor. Why rebalance? How do you rebalance? Rebalancing allows, to, allows investors to keep their, effectively their risk tolerance managed over time. We talk about drift. What's a, a percentage that might uh, trigger it, or is it by a calendar? Yeah, yeah. A lot of times, um, so in short, typically it's based on a percentage. We like to look at. We like to allow investments to drift, such that they can grow. We can allow them time to kind of grow and kind of meet expectations versus rebalancing based on a time period specifically. This might mean an asset class uh, gets to grow or kind of perform, maybe it's over a couple quarters or even a couple of years before it actually gets rebalanced back to a target allocation. Now contrast that with a situation where you're rebalancing every quarter or every year, right? Oftentimes we hear or see studies around rebalancing and the periods at which uh, investors should rebalance. And our view is it's really around allowing investments to drift, not getting too far out of weight, but allowing them to drift a bit, perhaps in that three to 5% range, before we scale them back. Calendar rebalancing, um, we've never really been a big fan of that just because in a sense you're only relying on time, not the actual underlying investment performance. When you have high growth companies, um, what can happen, you look back over the time period of those, right? those are high growth companies, but over time there's been different periods of lots of uncertainty. Tesla's a great example. In the last 10 years, Tesla's performance has been off the charts high. Um, that's great for investors that bought it, held it in that entire time. But if we actually were to go back and dissect year by year, really the vast majority of their performance occurred in just two years. That means eight of those years, you're likely underperforming the market. You're probably kicking yourself for owning it. But in two out of those 10 years, you're really glad you owned it. The takeaway there is when we invest in different types of assets to be patient over different time periods to understand if the thesis for owning them is still intact, but then also appropriately pairing them back, kind of pruning them over time um, if they do have a really large outperformance period because there may be a period in time where that's gonna underperform and then perhaps you can reallocate back into it. When you think about there's ultimately four different buckets and time periods that we're investing based on, we allow different levels of drift within different buckets. A good example is the long-term 15 or 16 plus year time horizon, right? We've got more time, we can allow more drift there. Contrast that with the short term, right? That, that one doesn't have as much room to drift because really we need that one to be reliable in there. And so we find ourselves rebalancing that one more often, reloading it. We don't wanna allow that first bucket to get too out of balance because that's the one that needs to be stable and um, support income needs in the short term. So in addition to managing drift and trying to keep a portfolio to policy, what are some other considerations people should be thinking about as they rebalance. Yeah, yeah. In terms of rebalancing, right, it's it's I mentioned before it's appropriate to make sure that the portfolios are invested and aligned with plan objectives. But very important when it comes to rebalancing, there are costs associated with it. Oftentimes it's taxes for accounts that are taxable accounts taxed in the year on capital gains like a brokerage account or trust account. It's important to make sure that we're weighing the cost benefit of taxes. We don't want to ignore taxes but we know and are mindful that taxes do play a role in overall portfolio management. Yeah, so it doesn't mean don't sell, don't rebalance, it's just be, be aware of that, those tax implications. Exactly, and being able to, in some scenarios, need to spread it out over perhaps a couple tax years. And that goes back to position sizing, where you're taking out risk in a portfolio and not allowing positions to get too large because then what can happen perhaps is you get a situation where you have really lumpy tax experience, maybe a really high tax bill in order to rebalance. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't want to let the tax tail wag the dog, as some people say, but it's important to keep in mind that taxes are an important part of rebalancing. We've talked about rebalancing mostly in terms of appreciation. Are there times where a depreciation uh, it triggers the rebalance? Yeah, absolutely. Um, great examples, I mean, we go through market declines. Right? We saw that in 2020, we saw that in 2022. Um, just like we see when markets go up, rebalance, same thing when markets are going down. Oftentimes, 
Um, as painful as it is to experience down markets, those are oftentimes some of the best markets to put dollars to work in some of these investments that have um, that are down in price at the moment. Again, it goes back to the time horizon. If we can put dollars to work and we have a long time horizon and the market's down, that can create a good outcome for when we come out of that market decline and really try to build and try to claw out of that um, drawdown period. Thank you all for tuning in and have a wonderful Mother's Day weekend.